Shalom and welcome to uh, this week's Bible study and Happy New Year. It's coming up in a few days and um, this week we'll be uh, looking at the best advice for 2024. Um, you know, how we should live and deal with things and prepare for things that we see happening in the world. Uh, there's a lot of unrest and trouble and, you know, uh, by a lot of standards, 2024 seems like a bleak year, a scary year and as Christians, you know, how should we respond to this and prepare for it? And, um, you know, how should we live in these times? And, uh, you know, with the wars and the economic problems, the political unrest, you know, and everything that's happening. Um, so we'll take a look at that today and we'll go ahead and pray and then we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for your word and all your blessings. We pray that you will help us to uh, read your word and study it today and understand it, and obey it, in Christ Jesus' name, amen. Okay, and, um, you know, like I was saying, you know, 2024, a lot of people are scared about it, um, and for good reason, because if you don't have the Bible, if you don't have Christ, if you are not anchored in Christ and trusting Him, and you don't have the Bible to guide you, it is, everything is looking very scary, um, you know, they, you got the war in Israel, you got war in Ukraine, you got Iran, threatening nuclear war, Russia is uh, threatening nuclear war, China is threatening war against nations, and, um, you know, it looks like we're on the brink of World War III. Uh, economic problems is happening all over the world, famine and droughts, food shortages, um, and all of this trouble is going on, and uh, so the best advice uh, that I've found in the Bible on how to deal with these things. Uh, first, you go to Proverbs 3, 5 through 7. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. So, first thing is, number one, you trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you don't go to your own understanding. Don't try to just figure it out yourself. Um, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And you acknowledge Him and you ask Him what to do. And He will show you what to do. And He will He will probably show different people different things to do. Um, and He will show you how to go through this. So that's number one is you look to God. And then also... You know, be not wise in your own eyes. Don't go off. Don't start sinning. Um, you know, I hear all the time, and I, I've seen it sometimes when the natural disasters happen or something. Uh, people who claim to be Christians, they will start looting. They will start hoarding. They will start doing things and, and not sharing with others. And they will start doing these things, which are sin. Um, you know, we're not supposed to be selfish. We're supposed to lay down our lives for the brethren as Christ laid down his life for us. Uh, we are not supposed to steal. Um, you know, we have to, we, we can't stop being Christians when hard times come since the church was born out of hard times anyway. Uh, you know, when the church first came into being, they were under the Roman government. Everybody was poor. Nobody had enough food to eat. It was dire times. And the church came together and they took care of each other. That's what we've got to do again. The church has to come together and take care of each other and and help each other. And we look to God for direction. And uh, so you know, depart from evil. Don't don't do any evil. Don't steal. Don't uh, be selfish and not share and give what you can. You know. And then also, don't worry about your needs. Jesus said in Matthew six thirty one through thirty four. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So this is speaking of even in evil days as we see coming, um, God is going to give us efficiency if, and it's conditional, it says, if 
we seek, says in 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. So you don't just seek the kingdom of God and will you're just going out and witnessing and telling people about Christ. You also have to seek his righteousness. That means you have to be repenting of your sins and trying to serve him and obeying his commandments and be faithful to him. Because if you're not faithful to him, you will be judged with the wall. When the famine hits the ungodly in the world, you will be caught up in it because you're not faithful and righteous and right with God. You're going to be caught up in that. Okay? The times that are coming is God's judgment on the world. This is the end times. This is God's judgment upon the world. Um, but if you're not faithful, if you're not serving him, you can get caught up in it. And if you don't obey him, you know, you can get caught up in it, um, and be harmed by it. Um, also remember that, you know, and it goes further in Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But you have to take the whole Bible into context. All the, you know, Proverbs 3, 7 and Matthew 6, 33 both say that this is conditional. You have to be righteous. You have to be seeking his righteousness. You have to be right with God. You have to be seeking him. You cannot be living in sin like the, you know, the evil sins of adultery and uh, you can't be stealing. I mean, if you don't do those things, you're not even saved. And if you're not saved, he's not going to provide for you because this is the time where he is, you know, judging the wicked. And um, so, you know, we need to make sure that you, number one, you know, be faithful to God, trust in him, and and then obey him on what he says to do to prepare for these hard times. Um and, we, and also, you do have the promise in Romans eight twenty eight, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who call all the called according to his purpose. So, and uh, now one thing I want to point out is that where it says all things work together for good, that doesn't mean that you're going to end up with more prosperity. or it's not. It means all things work together for good in how it's going to advance God's kingdom. You know, there are persecutions and sufferings of Christians, and that is used to advance God's kingdom. You know, that, that goes along with, but seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yes, there have been Christians who have starved to death in prisons, and they didn't have food, uh, but they were being persecuted, but they were seeking the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and they did die and go to heaven, so they were ultimately better off. Um, the persecutions happen. Um... So, you know, and persecution is happening all over the world, and it could be coming to America. So, you know, when it comes to persecution, that's when you just trust God and, you know, just keep that blessed hope in front of you. Hey, you know, Jesus is hopefully, you know, going to come back soon, and if he doesn't, well, then I'm going to die and go to heaven, and I'll be better off. Um, so, but aside from persecutions, there are all promises that, you know, if it's not persecutions, then... We would be protected from things like famine and these problems if we are trusting God. That then God is going to supply our needs, and we will be okay. And um, but it's all conditional upon us being obedient and faithful and trusting God. You can't just live like the devil and then expect God to supply your needs. Um, you can't even be disobedient to God, and you might be like, well, I don't live like that, well, I don't steal, I don't kill, okay, well, you can't, you have to seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, those two things, though, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, so if you're only saying, well, I haven't committed murder, or I've stolen, or anything like this, well, are you a lukewarm Christian, are you, are you doing, are you helping people like you should be, are you witnessing like you should be, are you obeying God? In other ways, you know, is your attitude correct? Are you nice to people like you should be? Um, are you standing for righteousness like you should be? Are you obeying God in these other things? Okay. Um, the, there's a two part there. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There's two parts. Okay. The one is, well, you definitely don't need to be doing anything evil. That's, you know, 
But then there's the other part where you're seeking the kingdom of God. It's not just that you're a good person, you don't do anything evil. It's that you are faithful to God. You're seeking the kingdom of God. You are serving God as king. And you're serving God as your king. Okay? Um, that's, uh, that's a, you have to do both in order for him to supply your needs. Um, and, uh, then, and it says here, you know, all things work together for good to them that love God. And then John fourteen fifteen says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So if you're not keeping his commandments, you're not loving him. And then things are not going to work together for you for good. Uh, you're just under judgment. And, um, you know, he's not going to supply your needs. And you, and you're not going to have, you might not have, you know, food and clothes and, and shelter like you need. Um, you know, you may not have those things because you're under his judgment. Um, uh, and then, uh, okay. And then first John five, one through four says, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we have that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. See if you love God and keep his commandments, you also want to love the children of God, which means you're not going to hoard up a bunch of stuff and be selfish and shoot anyone who tries to come in and get your food when those when those trouble, you're going to share it and you're going to you're, you're going to share it with other Christians, at, at least with other Christians, you're going to share it. And the Bible even says that if someone takes your coat, give them your cloak also, and turn the other cheek. So, you know, we're supposed to help people um, and not be selfish. Um, and then you have, uh, in verse First John 5, 3, it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So yes, if we want our faith to overcome the world, if we want our faith to be enough to where God is going to supply our needs, and we are going to be able to help others and still have enough, and we're going to be able to, you know, be a witness and a light in these dark times, we have to keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. We have to keep his commandments. And then we have, then our faith gives us victory, and we are able to overcome the world and overcome these problems. And like I said, this is um, these principles are, you know, God is going to take care of your needs. You're going to have plenty of, you're going to have food and water. The drought is not going to harm you. This thing, this stuff, uh, you know, if you are right with God and stuff. Now, this, the exception to this is persecution, and we all see in persecution it happens. So. You know, um, when the you know if the when the beast rises to power, a lot of Christians will be uh, having problems like this because they're not going to be able to buy or sell, um, and that's going to be due to persecution. So we do see that starting to rise, and um, you know, the war in Israel is you know happening. They did the they did a seven year covenant a few months ago. Then this war in Israel broke out. It looks like, you know, it's possible that the beast could come to power soon, possibly in 2024. Um, with everything happening, it looks like the whole world is falling apart. And the time is ripe for the for him to show up. Um, so, and there's a few people that people are saying could be the Antichrist. Um, and you know, we will see when it happens. The Bible does say that the Antichrist will be revealed. Um, so, you know, the best thing to do, even if persecution comes, you still trust in God and obey him. You know, persecution may make it to where you don't have food to eat and shelter and clothes. Um, but you're still right with God and he will deliver you. If not in life, he will deliver you through death. Um, and... And as Christians, that's what we face. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Um, persecutions happen, and we have to go through that. We just entrust the keeping of our souls to God. We obey Him. We stay faithful, and we will be rewarded in heaven. Everything is conditioned upon our faithfulness and our obedience to God and His word, His commands. That if you're not 
faithful and obedient to Christ, then you're not going to be blessed at all. Then, you know, you're going to have trouble in this life and you're not going to get rewards in the next. So, um, the best advice for 2024 is to trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding, depart from evil, and fully obey. And if you love God with all your heart, you're going to obey Him. So, yes, we sin, we mess up, we make mistakes, but a mistake is getting frustrated in the moment and saying the D word. That's a mistake, okay? Um, still going and looting a store because a hurricane or a tornado has happened and flattened the city. And running out and fighting with people and killing people and stealing and looting, those are not mistakes. Those are willful sins. Okay? Those are not mistakes. That is evil. That is willful sin. And someone who does that is not saved and they are going to go to hell unless they repent and get saved. Okay? So, Christians can't be using things like that. Oh, it was a mistake. No, that's not a mistake. That is a willful sin. You can't accidentally... Loot a store. Okay? You you can't do that. That's not possible. Okay? You make the decision ahead of time. It's premeditated. You're making the decision. You might make the decision in the moment, but you're still making the decision to do that. Um, that's not an accident. That's not a mistake. Okay? So, yes, we make mistakes. We sin in that way, but we don't do evil. A truly saved person cannot do evil. And you can watch the video that comes up at the end of all of the, um, uh, all, uh, most of my videos, it's got, like, a feature playlist that says how to get to heaven, and if you click on that playlist, there's a video down there that says, um, you know, since a saved person cannot do, um, but, so if, you know, the best advice is make sure that you're saved, make sure that you're right with God, you're obeying him, you're serving him, you're faithful to him, and you're trusting him to meet your needs. And, yeah, that doesn't mean you just sit back and go, oh, God's going to just drop blessings out of the sky and I don't have to do anything to repay you. No, the problem says that the prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself. Okay, we are, we're still supposed to have wisdom, but, you know, whether you invest in gold and silver because the dollar is going to fail, or you invest in these stocks or those stocks, or you take all your money out of the bank and hide it under your mattress, or you, you know, those kinds of things, I have no idea. You know, go, uh, you pray about it, you figure out what God wants you to do, and if he wants you to do anything like that. Um, God has not specifically told us what he's told us, trust me, you'll be okay. Uh, when it comes to that. And the only thing he's really told us is, well, make sure you have some water um, saved up. And make sure you have, you know, some food. Not We don't hold a whole lot of food. We just got, make sure you've got some canned goods and stuff. Um, and he's just told us to do a little bit of things like that. Um, and he said, trust me, I will meet your needs. Um, and we've also got gas masks. You know, he has told us, you know, get iodine, get gas masks, make sure you have first aid kit, um, different things if, for when <laughs> everything falls apart, some basic things that are like, yeah, we're going to need that. Um, you know, just some basic, that's all he's really told us to do, and so that's all we've done. Now, I have thought myself, you know, it'd probably be a good idea to get some gold and silver coins, so we have started investing in some of that, but right now we've got, we don't have any, we haven't been able to get any gold coins yet. Um, we've got like maybe, we've got less than $75 worth of silver so far. Um, so it's not, we're not even be able to gather that much. Um, because it's not something that God told us to do. It's just something we thought maybe we should do just in case. Um, but it's like God saying, well, don't. He's even told us, well, don't go throwing all your money into that. Um, because if the beast comes to power, it's not going to do any good anyway. Because you can't buy or sell without the mark. So it's going to go to a digital currency. Um, and 
you know, a lot of people still think that, oh, God's going to rapture us out of here before the beast comes power, and we have to worry about that. Well, the, the book of Daniel says that the beast is given, is uh, God allows the beast to overcome the saints. A lot of people say, well, that's just the tribulation saints. The church is out of here. Uh, I'm not convinced of that because Revelation says it's the only church age that it was the seven churches of Revelation, um, which is not only seven church ages, but it's also seven types of Christians, seven categories of Christians. Every Christian falls into one of those church ages. The only ones that are promised to escape the Great Tribulation and the Beast's reign is Philadelphia. So if you are not meeting the requirements of Philadelphia, if you are not totally right with God and seeking him and serving him as these verses that I've read today say you have to do in order to be, to have your needs met and to be blessed, then you are going, it sounds to me like you are going to suffer through the basis ring and you're going to, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. I believe now it's very plain that the Philadelphian church and Philadelphian Christians, the Christians who meet that criteria will escape. God says he will keep them from that hour and I don't think they're going to be raptured. I think if there was going to be a rapture, for any kind of pre-trip rapture, it would have already happened. Um, because the covenant was made in September. Right before the war broke out. The covenant was made like less than like a week or so before this war in Israel broke out. Um, so, you know, I think that um, it's very possible that this war in Israel will give rise to the beast. This is a catalyst to bring the beast forward. They're planning to sacrifice red heifers uh, on Passover this year. Um, so, and it says that the false prophet will call down fire from heaven. If you go read the Bible, when the temple was dedicated in Solomon's time and Solomon prayed, Fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. Elijah the prophet was not the only one that ever prayed down fire from heaven. Fire fell from heaven upon sacrifices many times in the Bible in order to show that God approved of the sacrifice. Okay? So Elijah wasn't doing anything new when he prayed that. Um, he was asking God to show which a sac sacrifice was acceptable to him, his or the prophets of Baal. We know from the story that the fire, fire fell on Elijah's sacrifice. That's the one everybody knows. But if you go read the dedication of the temple, it says that God answered with fire from heaven upon the altar. I believe that when they sacrificed those red heifers in, on Passover in 2024, that it is very, very possible that the false prophet will be there and that he will pray down fire from heaven upon those red heifers and it's going to be a great deception and everyone's going to think that that man is Elijah the prophet and it's, he's a fake and then he is going to turn everyone to worship the beast yeah, I believe it's coming I believe it's everything is in motion so Christians you know I don't believe we're being raptured out of this okay those who meet the criteria for Philadelphia will be spared Revelation promises that, but I believe that God's going to do something. He's not going to rapture us out. He's going to do something to keep us safe. And Philadelphia may be responsible for trying to help other Christians who are suffering, or God may just totally remove us and put us in our own places to where, you know, we're not around the world. He, he, he puts us, you know, there's a... In uh, Revelation, the, when the sixth seal is opened, there's a great earthquake. Um, the Isaiah 24 prophesies of a great destruction. There's many places in the Bible says that this, uh, some great destruction is going to happen. Um, it could be that the that a huge worldwide earthquake happens. Many different places are broken up, and Christians are God separates Christians uh, to their own little islands, um, away from everybody else, and they're able to survive that way. That is that is um, shown in the that that's possible. Um, 
somehow God is going to protect Philadelphia, but the others are all going to suffer. Even says of Thyatira that they he will throw them into a bed with the great whore and two great tribulations. So we absolutely know Thyatira is going through the great tribulation. So anyone who is a Thyatira Christian is going to suffer through the great tribulation. And then it says, and all the churches shall know that I am the, the he that tries the reins in the halls or something like that. So if the church has been raptured, how... Why would they need to know that? Says all the churches. So it doesn't sound to me like any church is going to be raptured. And I believe that, you know, the very beginnings of the Great Tribulation already heal. They did the covenant. You got this war in Israel. Everything's coming to your head. So the best advice is make sure you are right with God, that you are serving Him, you are um, faithful to Him, you have departed from evil. You know, and you're trying to serve him and please him, and that's the that's the best way to um, survive all of this that's coming. And um, so that's what I have. Yes, 2024 seems like a very scary year, but for those of us who are Christians and right with God, and we know that we have departed from evil, and we're not doing evil, and we're Doing, we're seeking the kingdom of God and we're obeying Him and we're trying our best. Well, God is going to take care of us. You do have in the fifth seal where you know a lot of Christians are being killed for their faith. Um, that is, and if you go to that, is the church of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna also had no condemnation, but they were a persecuted, so they were also a righteous church, but they were persecuted. So, some people may be Smyrna, well, okay, you're going to be persecuted and killed. Um, others would be Philadelphia, where, okay, we're going to be protected from this. Um, and each one has to submit to God and, and uh, you know, and accept that. And I believe that Philadelphia may... Uh, it may be possible that Philadelphia is in a position to help Smyrna during this time. I mean, we can help Smyrna for, and, and bring them, you know, is, the, well, is Smyrna going to be able to somehow come to us and we'll be able to help them and protect them? It's, it's possible and we have to be willing to do that. We, we have to be willing to help people. We can't be selfish and hoarding and you know, try to shoot people when they come asking for help. That's, you know, I see that that's been coming up for last 10 years since all this prepping stuff started up. Well, I'm gathering up, you know, um, we are, one thing we are not doing to prepare for this, we are not stockpiling guns and ammo. Okay. Yes, we have, we have a rifle to keep wolves away. Um... We have a couple of pistols for personal protection, um, f mostly from wolves and foxes, because they've been in our yard. My mother was growled at <laughs> one day. That was a wolf. <laughs> there was a wolf in the yard, and she went out, and she heard a growl and came right back in the house. Um, you know, we've got wild animals. That's mostly what all guns are for. Um, not, not for people asking for help. Um, no, we're not stockpiling guns and weapons. Um, so, like that. I mean, we've got what we need for personal protection, for, like, normal personal protection. We're not stockpiling guns and weapons. Um, and all of our guns are legal. Um, we don't, we're not buying off the black market or anything. Um, we don't do that. That's not something that we're worried about. I don't think Christians are supposed to be too worried about things like that. Um, you know, we're supposed to be willing to help people. Um, and so we have to make sure that we are being Christians and being right with God, you know, and serving God. Uh, we can't steal and kill and act like the world. That's that God's not going to bless that. And if someone does that, they're not to a, a true Christian. They're not going to heaven. Um, they're not truly saved. It doesn't matter if they pray to prayer, prayer once. Um, and if, if it doesn't even matter if they believe the facts about Jesus and go to church every Sunday. If you can steal 
if you can intentionally, you know, if you can loot a store, if you can be a part of that, then you're not saved. Um, that's theft, and, and you're not saved. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just how it is. Um, so, you know, the best way to survive the days ahead and be blessed by God, at least in the end, when you get to heaven, is to make sure you are right with God, you're obeying him and seeking him and seeking his will. And, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. Just ask God what to do and do what he tells you to do. Like with us, he hasn't told us much. He's like, okay, well, you know, you might want to make sure you got some extra water. Keep some canned goods or foods around. Um, you know, we don't have a lot. We just have a small pantry and we just keep, like, we got maybe, we got about three cases of beans. Um, because that's high protein and that's, um, we got, like, maybe three cases of beans and a case of green beans. You know, that gives us nutrition. Um, that's about what we've been able to do, and then we have to rotate that out every few months, because it goes bad, and then we have water, we've got about 15 gallons of water that will last us a few days, um, he's pretty much told us that we have to be prepared to survive three days, um, so, you know, for when the destruction happens. Um, that's what he's told us. It could, I don't know if it's because, now it could be that we're on a well, and we get our water that way. It could be because of where we live, so where you live may be different on your, on what you need to do. That's why I said, don't just do what we do. God may want you to do something different. You might need other things. Um, you know, and so, like, well, for one thing, none of us are on any, on any kind of medication, like insulin or heart pills or anything. So people who have those problems, you know, you might need to talk to your doctor and see if you can get uh, some extra medicine to save up. That can be something important. Um, so, you know, I've heard of people, uh, you know, saving up some insulin. Um, that can be, that might be important um, if you need that. And, uh, you know, those different different people have different needs. So that's why each person needs to go. I can't sit here and say, okay, you will for sure survive this if you do this, that, and that. I mean, I have been hearing questions. Oh, go invest in these stocks and you'll make it. And I'm going, well, I don't even know how true that is because if the whole system fails, the beast comes to power, you cannot buy or sell, then what good is the stock market going to do you? The whole system is going to fail. Or you're going to be locked out of the system because you're a Christian. I mean, they're already shutting down Christians' bank accounts. You know, so um, we'll already see. They've already, I've heard that Congress has passed a digital dollar already. I mean, things are in the work. So I don't know if it's a small thing to invest in anything in our current financial banking stock market system. That's probably not the wisest thing to do. Um, but if God tells you to invest in some stocks, I mean, you know, I could be wrong. So, you know, go pray and ask God what to do. And if he tells you to invest in certain stocks, then do it. Um, maybe somehow those stocks will survive. I don't know. Um, but yeah, go, you know, you just do what God won't tell you to do. That's why it's an individual thing. You have to trust in the Lord and you pray and obey him. And you trust him, and he will, if you are right with him and trust him, he will take care of you, um, and he will, he will meet his needs according to his will, okay? If God has chosen you to be someone who is persecuted by the beast, if, if he's chosen you to be Smyrna, um, then you will end up dying for your faith, and you may go hungry and stuff, but when you get to heaven, you will receive we won't. It says that. You will, your eternity will be better. Um, so everyone must, you know, serve God and be faithful to him. And, you know, as, and if you are blessed to be a Philadelphian who is not persecuted and you are all able to have food and stuff, if you have opportunity to help someone who is persecuted, then you have the absolute responsibility to do that. Because the Bible says that God gives us God gives us uh, 
like he it says that he allows us and gives us strength to walk uh and get gained so that we can help others and that that's other Christians so um you know the the most important thing is the our first priority is to help other Christians the world is under God's judgment well not someone yes we have mercy on the poor and we help them when we can but they get the leftovers they don't get the first they don't get the best that goes to the other Christians who are needing help and that's one thing that churches get wrong so much is they'll go and have all these ministries to the wicked to the drug addicts the drunkards the prisoners who are people who went to prison got out of prison but they went to prison for murder okay or for drugs or for theft They're, they're helping the world and then the faithful Christians who are in the church and the father dies and there's no income and so then the that there's nothing for the church to help the widow and the children um and they end up on food stamps and homeless living in their car and the church won't help them that is absolutely unbiblical and <laughs> God is going to that that's 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 why the that's that's why the saints that's why so many saints will be given into the hand of the beast it's a judgment. It's a purification of the church. Because, you know, the book of Daniel says that the beast is given power over the saints to overcome them. Well, why? Because the saints have sinned. They're not obeying God. They're not loving people. They're not doing what God told them to do. Um, you know, it's like the wolves that Jesus talked about. Well, they go to him he says not everyone that saith to me Lord Lord will enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven and then they they look at him and go, but God didn't we prophesy in your name and didn't we minister didn't we do all this stuff and then oh you have the one also where Jesus is telling that he was hungry and in prison and thirsty and he didn't come and they didn't come to him and they're like well we ministered to people and, and we did this and we did that and we meant who did we not minister to what he was saying is, okay, you did all of these, you did prison ministries to evil people. You gave food to drug addicts and drunkards that lived on the street, that was homeless on the streets. But you didn't do it to the one of the least of my children. You didn't do it to the woman who lost her husband and had three kids to feed. You let you you didn't do anything to help them. You didn't make sure that they had a house to live in, that she had a job, that her children were educated and a, were given a godly education, didn't have to go to the devil's schools. You did not take care of them. That's what they will be judged on. That's the difference. All these churches they 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 preach tithing wrong. Uh, which is they 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 rob people by telling them that they're under the Old Testament law of tithing, which they are not, and then they don't, and then the pastors live, have you know they have their Lincolns and their Mercedes and their houses with swimming pools, and they do all that, but then they complain because they have to go fix a missionary's, um, a retired missionary's, uh heat pump for the winter I mean and that happened in a Baptist church that I was in for years and years and years um the pastor who did that had was my pastor when I was a teenager and I'm sitting there going he drives a Lincoln he lives in a house with a swimming pool he brags about it but when this faithful missionary who is in his 80s has health problems and you know and he's old and feeble his heat pump goes out he is going to die if they can't fix it if they, if they don't fix it and the pastor's up there complaining because they had to fix his heat, heat pump unfortunately at the time my family and i were poor and living in low-income housing and we did not have the money to be able to help out with that i guess the church did finally did go fix it um but they complained about it. They shouldn't have complained about it. Um, that was a faithful man, and he 
deserve to be taken care of by the church, and they were complaining because they had to take care of it. Those kinds of things, that is sin and that is evil, and that's why those kind of Christians are going to be put into the hands of the beast for the persecution in order to purify them because they are, their hearts are evil. Their hearts are evil. They're not right with God. Um, churches are supposed to help people, not take people's money. Yes, sir, you are supposed to, but if you look at the Bible, it says you are supposed to support. Paul is very strict. You know, you have to support your church. You have to support your church leaders. But the Bible says that the elders that were well are worthy of double honor. Okay, they get paid double, not millions of times more. I don't see anywhere in the Bible, you know, stewardship is only to church leaders. If you look at the uh, parable of the steward, it says he had wasted his Lord's goods, not his own. Not everything that we, yes, everything that everything in the world is God's, he made it. And in a general sense, everything we have is God's because he gave it to us, he made it. But we have personal rights to that. Because God even told, the Bible says in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, the apostles, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said that, they said, it was yours, and you could have done whatever you wanted to do with it, you didn't have to lie about it. We have personal rights to our property, okay? The apostles, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, said that Ananias and Sapphira had the right to do whatever they wanted to do with the sale of their house and land. They didn't have to bring it. They didn't even have to bring it, and they surely didn't have to lie about it. They were killed for lying about it. But he, they didn't, he, and you know, he did. He noticed, he said, when it was in your hand, it was yours. Do whatever you wanted. He said, you had the right to do whatever you wanted with it. He did not say that they had to give 10% tithe off of it. He didn't say that they had to give any of it. Okay, tithing is an Old Testament thing, not New Testament. <coughs> These churches that are fleecing the flock, saying that you have to give 10%, and saying that you have to give 10% of your government check that doesn't even pay your bills, that's robbery. That's greedy. That's being greedy of filthy lucre. It says that a pastor, a bishop is a steward. A pastor is a steward. So a bishop is a pastor. A pastor is a steward. The ones who get in trouble for stewardship, doing stewardship wrong, are these pastors who waste the Lord's goods because they rob the sheep and then they don't help them. Then the faithful people will give the church thousands and thousands of dollars, but when they get on hard times, the church won't help them or the church will complain about helping them. And they won't, and they, they don't want to help them, they don't help them, and they end up on the streets homeless, and then the church stands in judgment of them because, oh, you're homeless. So now you're a bad person for some reason. Um, that really makes God mad, and th this is these are reasons why he's turning the church over to the beast. He's he's going to turn these Christians over to the beast because they are evil. They're not truly saved. They're they're blaspheming his name. They're a bunch of lost people blaspheming his name and robbing his sheep. Uh, yeah, he's not happy about that. Um, the New Testament principle of giving is you give as the Lord has blessed you, and that is not a minimum ten percent. That is that you give as the Lord has blessed you. If as the Lord has blessed you means above your needs, above your basic needs, make sure you have housing, make sure your mortgage is paid, and your um and you and your electric bill is paid, and your water bill is paid, and you have food to eat. You know, then you give. Off of that, now there is a teaching of sacrificial giving, uh, but it's actually not sacrificial giving is never actually commanded. It says we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, so you have that there. Um, so we can give sacrificially, but it's not a dogmatic law where you have to sacrificially give or God is going to curse you, um, and you're going to lose your job or something. No, um, and one person explained sacrificial giving well, sacrificial giving may not necessarily be to where you give your food money or your mortgage money. But where if someone in the, let's say that you've got five, an extra $500 and you're going to take your family on a trip to an amusement park. But then a week before you go and you haven't, 
already reserved anything or anything, um, then, you know, well, maybe a couple months before you go on that, you find out that another church member who is faithful, well, something's happened, they've hit hard times, and they cannot pay their electric bill. And in where I live, a $500 a month electric bill in the wintertime is normal. Okay, it's high here. It's expensive. Um, so, they can't pay their electric bill, and their electric bill is $500. The sacrificial giving is where you take the $500 that you were going to go spend at the amusement park, and you give it to them for their electric bill. Okay, it's not it's not necessarily that you have to give the money that you need to eat on, or that you take your mortgage money to help pay the electric bill. It's where you take your extra money that we were going to use, go to an amusement park, and you're like, well, no, we're not going to go to the amusement park because they need electricity, and it's the dead of winter, and if they don't have electricity, they're going to freeze to death. Okay, we're going to give them the $500. That's that's the sacrificial giving, okay? Um, now, in the Bible, there was people who gave beyond their means, who actually sacrificially gave, and um, that's what Philippians... Uh, for, that's what uh, Philippians four nineteen is actually talking about. Where it says, "My my God shall supply your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus." They had given beyond their need, though they have they had given beyond what they could. They actually sacrificially gave to the extreme to where they didn't know if they were going to be able to pay their bills and have enough food to eat, but they were going to trust God and give it to Paul because Paul didn't have food to eat. You know, and um, so they will, they gave it to the Apostle Paul, and he said that God would meet their needs. Okay, that's what that was the context of that. Um, so there is, you know, they try to say, well, Abraham had ten percent, gave ten percent, um, and stuff, <coughs> but <coughs> when you're looking at Abraham, it doesn't say why he gave it. God did not command him to give it. It doesn't say that he gave it out of faith and love for God. It says that he gave it, he just simply gave it to Melchizedek, who was a king and a priest. And I recently found out that, um, you, you know, before, there was no biblical command before the law to give tithes of any kind. It's never said that Isaac ever gave tithes. Um, you have Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek of the spoils of war. That came from Sodom and Gomorrah for one thing. Okay. It was heathenistic spoils of war. He gave 10% to Melchizedek. But then he ended up giving the other 90% back to Sodom and Gomorrah. And the other cities that had been taken from. Abraham didn't keep any of that. He just. Well it said that he kept just what was taken from him and his family. You know from Lot and his family personally. Uh, but the actual spoils. He, he, he didn't keep any of that. He gave it back to the cities, and he gave 10% to um, Melchizedek. But Abraham had come from the Chaldeans. He had come from uh, basically Babylon. It was all the Chaldeans, basically the same area as Babylon. At that time, it was the law of the land in Chaldea and I guess in other places. He had been raised with a law. That had said that spoils from the spoils of war, you had to give ten percent to your priest king because Babylon or the Chaldees they did have a priest king. Um, it wasn't a holy priest king, it wasn't a godly priest king. But Babylon, when while Abraham was growing up, the his, history, you know, they had a priest king, and it was actually law of the land that they had to give the spoil ten percent of the spoils of war to that. Priest king. Now, Melchizedek was a holy priest king of God himself, you know, of God. Um, and many people think it was Jesus, which it very well could have been. He could have been Jesus. Um, and so, Abraham was just simply going with what he had been taught. It wasn't a command of God. He was like, oh, this is a priest king, and this is actually a priest of the God of heaven, not of a false deity. And so I'm going to give him, I'm going to follow my custom and give him 10% of all the spoils of war. Um, 
It doesn't, so it doesn't say that Abraham did that in faith at all or did it for God at all. He just did it. It, it just says that he did it. And if you look at the history, well, it was like something that he had been raised with. It was part of his culture. So that's why he did it. There's no proof anywhere in the Bible that Abraham gave that tithe in faith. Anything any, anything where Abraham is mentioned for faith, it has to do with the sacrifice of Isaac, uh, going into the land of Canaan, um, a lot of other stuff he did by faith. But it doesn't say that he gave that tithe by faith. That's not in there. When Jacob told God that he would, that if you bless me and take care of me, then I will give you 10%. Well, Jacob had just cheated his brother out of everything. Uh, he was chosen to plan to... Jacob was trying to manipulate God into blessing him. It worked because God is merciful and Jacob was chosen. And so God will bless his chosen people. He has mercy. God was merciful and he, he blessed Jacob. But Jacob's tithe is, is, not, is a really bad example because he was actually trying to manipulate God. And it worked, um, but then, you know, he did wrestle with God, and God permanently injured him because, yeah, to put him in his place later. Um, but, you know, so those two times before the law, neither one of them was commanded by God. Isaac, in the middle between Abraham and Jacob, Isaac never tithed. And he sold, it's, it just says that he sold in the land and got a hundredfold his first year. He doesn't say that he tithed any of it. Uh, when you have it with Ananias and Sapphira, they sold the house. And the apostles did not say, well, you had to give the 10%, but then you could have done what you wanted to with the rest of it. Or, you know, well, it was all it was all God's anyway, so you had to give all of it. They didn't say that. They said it was yours. The money was yours when it was in your hand to do with it what you wanted. They didn't say that they had to, that Ananias and Sapphira had to give any of that money. Because tithes, under the when they actually became a command to tithe in the Old Testament, under the law, under Numbers 18, the tithes was only of the land, the fruit of the land of Israel. It was never money. It was never even, you know, you never have any of the disciples or Jesus paying tithes because Jesus was a carpenter. Uh, most of the disciples, a lot of the disciples were fishermen. It never says that they tithed. On the fish. Now, Jesus, it never says that Jesus tithed on his carpenter. The money that he made from being a carpenter. It never says that they tithed on any of that. The tithe was the fruit of the land only. Um, and so that was the tithe. It wasn't, it wasn't money. It wasn't wages. So, you know, and it was never commanded to the church. Um, the church is commanded to support, but... A pa for a pastor to live in a million dollar mansion when he's got someone in his church that make a family in his church that lives on 20, 20, 000, 20 to 25,000 a year that is unbiblical because the pastor is only supposed to receive double honor. That honor though is money. They're supposed to receive double pay. So you take the I think that the fairest way to figure that out is you would figure out how much the cost of living is so the, and this would be the most that a pastor gets, the absolute most that a pastor gets. Um, many churches would not be able to afford this because even we, and a lot of times, many small churches and poor churches, you know, they just can't afford to give their pastor this much, and the pastor has may have to work uh, another a job or something that happens a lot of times. That's fine, but the most that a pastor would receive would be double, and that what what I think that that means is that you would look at the cost of living for your area and be like okay how much is the cost of living in this area for a family of the pastor's size you would figure that up and you go okay the pastor is worthy of double pay double money double honor that word honor there is honorarium it's money okay that's his wages that's his pay for being pastor he's only worthy of double not a million times okay not even a thousand times okay he's worthy of double so you take how much it should cost him and his family to live in your society in your town your city um you would take that and you would go okay 
So this is how much it's going to co- it would cost him to survive. At the most, he gets double that. That's what the word of God says. He is worthy of double that. Okay. The other one, the deacons and other people on the payroll would get their live what the cost of living. The pastor gets double the cost of living, and it has to in order for it to be fair, it has to go by family size and what they actually need. So if the pastor is a, is an older man, it's only him and his wife. Well, he gets double of what it would take for him to live. But yet, if he's got a deacon who is faithful, and that deacon's got 20 kids, well, the deacon would get just the cost of his cost of living, but that amount of money may, it was going to be quite a bit more than what the pastor gets, even though the pastor is getting double his cost of living because the other guy's got 20 kids to feed and the pastor don't. Um, it's, it's so in a way, so they in a way, you know, it still like equals out. Um, but the pastor is only supposed to receive double. Pastor is not supposed to live. You're not supposed to take the tithes of the people, or not the tithes, but the givings, because it's not it's not a ten percent tithe. You're not supposed to take from the offerings of the people for the church and take that and get rich off of it. Uh, like that. You're not supposed to, if the, if you've got a bunch of rich people in your church and, and they are giving millions of dollars, that money is supposed to go help other poor Christians. It's supposed to go, you know, they brought the stuff to the apostles' feet and distributed it among the poor in the church. Um, and so that's what you're supposed to do. That, you know, you can give it to missions, you can give it to the poor. It's not supposed to be, let's go buy a bigger church building, let's go get nicer things, let's get the pastor a Lamborghini and a Harley Davidson and a mansion. No, that's not, that, that's not what it's supposed to be for. Um, that is wrong, that is theft. Now, the pastor could take, let's say you give your pastor... If it's just the pastor and his wife, you know, in a lot of places, they might be able to make it on 25000 a year. So you give your pastor, okay, so he can make it on 25000 a year. He's worthy of double, so you give him 50000 a year. Um, that's a lot less than 10. I have heard of pastors who make $10 million a year. That's, that's not, I mean, unless, I, mean, I don't even think that would be right if they lived in Hawaii or Hollywood. Um, you take some of the most expensive places on earth, I don't think you have to have 10 billion a year to survive. Okay, or that would even be double of what you would need to survive. Um, so, let's say the pastor, you give your pastor $50,000 a year, um, you know, that is, that's the most, if it, if it costs him $25,000 a year to live, then the most that he can receive is $50,000 a year from the offerings of the church. Now, there's nothing wrong with the pastor then taking part of that 50000 and investing it in some way and getting rich that way. That's not a problem. And then that money is his, and he is only commanded to distribute as necessary to the poor and to help out. There's nothing wrong with a pastor being rich. There is something wrong with the pastor taking, you know, making himself rich by directly taking all that money from the church, from the offerings of the people and fleecing the flock like that. And especially telling people, God's going to curse you and you're going to lose your job if you don't, you know, I, you know, if you don't give me money, um, that, that's not right. And so, you know, you have to be right with God and you can't be cheating people. I mean, this is why God's going to turn these people over to the beach because they're evil. You know, you know, these churches and pastors are preaching, oh, there's trouble coming. You got to support me. You got to, you got to give us money and all this. And we got to prepare for all this trouble that's coming. And you got to, you've got to support me and give me all this money. So that, and, but then they're not giving anything back to the church people who need help. They are just being selfish. And it's a, it is a heresy. It's a wrong teaching. And, you know, especially when it comes to Baptist. Baptists claim to only have two ordinances. Okay? Baptists claim to only have two ordinances, and that is of the Lord's Supper and baptism. Did you know that tithing is an ordinance? Go back to Numbers 18. 
Tithing is an ordinance. If the Baptist church only has two ordinances, then we can't preach tithing. Or we're going to have to say that all the Baptists have been wrong and we actually have three ordinances. But as I've studied the Bible out, there is no ordinance of tithing in the New Testament. It actually says that that ordinance was done away with in Hebrews. Uh, I'm going to do a whole study on tithing um, sometime and I'll go through all that. But it, what I have recently learned has been really eye-opening. And, you know, I've been wrong about tithing. Um, you know, I had realized that the poor were, wasn't supposed to, didn't have to tithe because it's increased. And that's, that would be your extra, not, not everything that comes to you is increased. You definitely wouldn't have to pay tithes, even if we were under a tithing law like I thought we were. You know, I did realize that, well, the poor don't pay tithes because they can't afford to. Um, but no, nobody... It pays tithes. It's not a set amount. The poor, um, the poor don't absolutely have to give anything unless you know God tells them to. Um, you know if they want to give, um, they're not the poor are not required to give because they can't afford to. The uh, rich are the ones who are required to give. You know, in the early church, it was the rich who supported the pastor, not the poor. Um, the church, the rich supported the pastor and the church supported the poor. That's how it was. Um, and the only time that there, that there was any time when you didn't help someone, it says that if you don't walk, you don't eat. But there's a lot of people who walk today who do not make enough money to live. And so they're on government help. Well, they shouldn't be on government help. They're supposed to be on church help, but the church won't help them. So the government has to help them. I mean, you know, that's, that's really, you know... That's how it is, and the the church is supposed to help people, but people have to go to the government for help because the church won't help them, and all the church wants, you know, the, these people who preach on tithing, they go so far, well, you're supposed to tithe on your food stamps. You're supposed to tithe on anything you get, so if somebody gives you a sandwich, you have to give, you have to figure out the monetary cost of that sandwich and tithe 10% of that to God. Well, how are you supposed to do that when they just gave you a sandwich and you don't even have a nickel? In your pocket, how you then? Oh, you're indebted to God somehow? No, that see those, and they those just all kinds of trouble with that teaching. Now the truth of um, you know, you give as the Lord hath blessed you, and if you can't pay your bills, then God has not blessed you to where you can give. Okay, if you're having to get food stamps from the government, then God has not blessed you to where you can give. You give as the Lord hath blessed you. Um, when Paul was, uh, rebuking people for not supporting him, he was rebuking the rich, not the poor. Um, and the whole thing about stewardship, I looked through the New Testament looking at stewardship and I'm going, stewardship is only for church leaders. It's not every individual personal Christian. It's church leaders. So there's a lot of church leaders, a lot of churches and a whole lot of trouble because they have wasted the Lord's goods. They waste those, they, they rob the people, tell them that they have to give when they don't, and they have to give more than they have to give. They rob God's people, and then they go and waste God's goods by buying themselves mansions and Lamborghini. They're taking church money, they're taking God's money from the church, and they're buying mansions and little jets and Lamborghinis and Harley Davidsons. Now, if they want to take their portion, of what God says, okay, this is my money, you're the pastor, you get this much, this is your personal money, now you can do what you want with it. If they take that poor little portion of money and they save it up or they invest it and then they get the money to where they could buy themselves a Lamborghini or Holly, you know, they can do that. That 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 could be okay and not be a sin as long as they're not allowing someone, you know, that's where that sacrificial giving comes in. Well, okay, if a church member <laughs> is... Uh, needs a uh, help with a mortgage, then okay, you can't buy your Lamborghini. You, you got to help them. But you know, the, it can be right for a pastor to have things like that as long as everything else is in place and he didn't directly take it from the church money. You know, he didn't go, Oh, I want a Lamborghini, so I'm just going to go over here right now and take a hundred thousand dollars from the church funds because I'm the pastor and. And God's really blessing me, and I deserve it, and I'm going to go buy me a Lamborghini. No, he could take his $50,000 a year pay and go, okay, I'm going to invest this $10,000 into something, 
And then from that ten thousand dollars, after a few years, it turns into a hundred thousand. It's like okay, well, everyone in the church is okay, and I've given, you know, I give and I'm right with God and everything, and I really want a Lamborghini. So, and everybody in the church is taken care of. So I'm gonna go buy a Lamborghini. Um, that's not wrong because with Ananias and Fire, he said the money was yours to do what you would. If the money is yours, you can do what you want to with it. As long as there's not someone in your church who is in need. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, you can do what you want with it. And they, um, you know, they were just wanting praise of men and to be look like big shots. And it got them into trouble because they lied about it. Um, but it said that it was theirs to do with what they wanted. So, no, the your money is not God's money in that way. You have personal right over your money. God gives us, another verse says, God gives us all things freely to enjoy. Um, the problem is not, the stewardship is not for the individual Christian. It's for the church leaders, for the pastor. The pastor is not supposed to go take a hundred thousand dollars out of the church funds and go buy himself a Lamborghini. Well, I don't even know if Lamborghini costs that much, but some cars do. Um, I think a, uh, uh, you know, one of those Tesla electric cars, they're like a hundred thousand, I think. Um, some cars cost a hundred thousand dollars, but he can't just go take. That's not what that he. That's what, and that's what they do. They will take. They will buy their mansions and their little jets, and that's what they do. And no, the most is the pastor can take directly from the church funds is double his cost of living. That's the most he can take. He can't take anything else. And in the Bible, you know, in the tithe in the Old Testament was never used for the temp for the temple, uh, for the building of the temple, the upkeep of the temple. It was never used for missions. It was only used to support the places. All that was if they needed money to any time that they needed money to repair the temple that was, they asked the people to bring it, and the people willingly bought it. Um, and they said, hey, okay, so that'd be like a building fund. Hey, everybody, if you can, you know, give what you can for the building fund, because, you know, we need a new roof, we need, you know, and in the church, and when it came to the church, there was no church building in the church. They all met, met in homes, and usually met in rich people's homes. Um, so, using God's money to make a huge building and and put in all this costly stuff, I, that's not for the new... See, they keep mixing the Old Testament temple and the Old Testament temple system with the church. They're, they're two distinct organizations, two distinct things, and they keep mixing those, and they're going to get in trouble for it because they are, they are not being good stewards of God's money. Okay. Being a good steward of God's money does not mean that individual Christians must live in poverty or even minimalistic. It means that church leaders must use church funds properly. And if they don't, then they are robbing God. These church leaders who take church funds and go buy man themselves mansions and little jets and Lamborghinis and Harley Davidsons and Cadillacs and all that, they are being unfaith unjust uh stewards and they are wasting God's goods. That's what that's talking about. And that's why, you know, that's why God's gonna turn them over to the beast and let the beast have them because he's gonna grind them the powder because they have robbed him. And that's that's how people rob God in the New Testament. It's not that they've robbed him tithes and offerings. It's, well, they've robbed him in offerings because they have taken the offerings for themselves. And they're not even using it for God. And that is where that stewardship comes in. I've looked through the New Testament. There is no personal stewardship. I can't find it. Anytime it is speaking of stewardship, it says that he wasted his Lord's goods. He was put as a manager over something. He had authority over something. It was not his personal money. It was the Lord. And it wasn't. It's, 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 it, he's actually in authority over God's heritage. He's actually. It, it sound, it's church leadership. It's not. Well, I work a job. I get wages. But it's God's money. So. I can't 
I can't go spend it. You know, I can't buy myself a Cadillac um, or a designer handbag because then I'm not being a good steward and I have to give it to the poor. That is, I cannot find that in scripture anywhere. That is a heresy and that is wrong. Um, the Bible just says that, you know, if you see someone in need, you help them. Um, you have to be willing to help people. Um, and you can be willing to help people and have nice things. There's, there is nothing in the Bible that teaches a poverty, uh, lifestyle or a minimalistic lifestyle that those are commanded. That's not commanded. It says that the rich men are supposed to be willing to give. Okay, it doesn't, I can't even find where sacrificial giving is commanded, where, oh, well, you have to give to where it, you feel it actually, you, you, it hurts your pocketbook somehow. Because some people are so, I mean, I'm not, but you got, you get someone like a billionaire that's so rich, well, they're not even able to give that much, um, you know, to anything godly, to anything, to people who are actually saved and, and, who they're commanded to give it to, they can't even give that much to where it would hurt them. It's just, they just have to be willing when they see a need in the church, when they see a Christian struggling, because we have to remember, we're commanded to give to Christians. We're not commanded to give to the drug addict, people. You're not commanded to give to the drug addict and the drunkard on the street. You're commanded to give to Christians who are in trouble. Not to the world, not to the drug addict, not to the drunkard. You're not commanded to give to those people. We, there, there is a little bit, yes, we have mercy on the poor, and we can use that as an outreach, but our first priority, we give to Christians who are in need. And if there's not any Christians in your area that's in need, well, there's a whole lot of them in Africa, Asia, South America, there's a whole lot of Christians around the world who are in need, and you can give to them, okay? Um, so, you know, how do you survive the next you will you be faithful and true and honest and you know you give what you can give when you see someone in need you don't go fleece your flock and tell them oh you have to give 10 percent to me or god is going to take your job from you that's not in the new testament that's not biblical that is and and tithes was never money the biblical tithe the commanded tithe that god commanded was only food from the land of israel it was nothing else. And so I'll do a full study on that later. But, you know, um, so don't think that, you know, just because you're giving God thousands of dollars or 10% that he's going to bless you and give you uh, more money. The, the In all of this on how to survive, tithing isn't mentioned in one place. It says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. It says, be right with him, be faithful to him, serve him. Um... You know, and he will seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, love other people. So it's not a 10% tithe mention. The, the giving would be involved in loving others, but it's not a 10% tithe. You give what you can give to help somebody else. It's not, it's the, it, you know, biblically, the rich, if you're rich, well, you're probably going to give more than 10%. And if you're poor, you're going to give less than 10%. You, you know, you may not give anything because if you can't, even feed yourself how can you help someone else so um it's not it's never wrong to give but it is wrong to it is wrong to oppress the poor and tell the poor that they have to give that is sin and that's why god's judging people so you know if you're a church leader if you're a pastor you had better stop telling people that they have to tithe 10 percent when they are getting, when they are on government help, because that is going to cause God to turn you over to the beast and destroy you. Um, you're going to suffer, um, and so you know, make sure you're not uh, cheating people, and make sure that you are living right, and make sure that you are faithful to God and right with Him. Um, and you're seeking him, and, and you, you know, just love God, love others, and obey God. Um, because love gives to the poor. It doesn't take from the poor. So if you're taking from the poor, you're not loving God. If you're demanding the poor give you money when you're rich, um, that's, that's evil. Um, 
So, you know, these churches and people, they need to stop preaching that 10% tithe because that's going to cause them to fall into God's judgment for what's coming, and they are not going to survive it. Um, so, you know, the best advice for 2024 is, you know, obey God, trust Him, love others. You know, when it comes to giving, give what you can give to help other people. If you're poor, don't worry about it. Um, you know, and you trust God for your needs. And, um, you know, and, and it has to, and everything has to be in a true and pure and honest heart. And, and you're obedient to him, you're keeping his commandments. Then he will take care of you. And if you are chosen for persecution, okay, you'll die and go to heaven. But then you will have rewards in heaven. If you are not faithful in obeying God, then you're not going to be protected in this life or get rewards in heaven. And you're probably going to end up in hell because you're probably not saved. So, um, that is my message for today, and it was over an hour. I didn't think it'd be that long. Um, so, um, I'll go ahead, we'll close in prayer, and, um, I will do the, uh, blessing over you when we get done here. And, um, so we'll go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day and for your word and all your blessings. Help us, we will serve you and do right, and we will be giving and loving and we won't oppress the poor or rob from them. And we pray that you'll bless us and help us. And uh, I pray that you will um, uh, help us to uh, serve you and obey you. And um, you'll keep everyone who is worthy uh, safe and um, give extra grace to uh, the ones that you have chosen for them to be persecuted. And help us to help them as much as we can. And uh, we pray that you'll bless us. And um, give us a good week. And help us to all stay faithful to you. In Christ Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Ya Rebekah Adonai Vayish Merekah Ya'er Adonai Panav Aleka Viku Neka Yisah Adonai Panav Aleka Ve'asim Leka Shalom The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Thank you so much for watching this week and um, thank you for everyone who likes the videos and comments and shows them. That really helps our channel. And, you know, if God does lay it on your heart to support our ministry in any way so that we can have more resources to reach more people for Christ, please use the Patreon or PayPal links in the description. Thank you so much and God bless you. Have a wonderful week and Happy New Year. Bye.